a series called New Creation Realities. Come on in here, everybody. And the walking around stops now because we're in the Word. Okay, we don't want anybody to miss eternal words of eternal life. And in a lot of churches, we need to, you know, just be seated. If you have to use the restroom, it's absolutely okay. But I want to let you know, when the Word's going forth, less distraction, the better for everybody else. Now, I understand we have needs and we have to do things. But amen. All right. And how many know it's not what's being taught? It's being what is being caught. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about today and then we're going to go to our scriptures. The power of the revealed word. The power of the revealed word. And now before I get into that teaching, I want to share. Have you noticed that this planet has uh, is fallen? You notice there's problems in this planet. How many years notice it? You know, when I was growing up, I, I had no idea that this problem, this planet had this big of a problem. And it isn't until we actually get saved and we actually walk with God that we can begin to see the corruption like never before. Now, when we take God out of things, they fall apart. A family takes God out of their lives. Their children rebel. The, the life of the family just falls apart because God holds all things together. You take God out of a country, what happens to the country, folks? It falls apart. Amen. So I'm going to just share a little bit before we, before we actually get into our lesson and why God does the things that he does, why God sent us the Holy Spirit. But I want to talk to you. If you're believing, how many here ever had to believe for a healing? Okay, so I want to talk to you for a minute. When you ask God for something, the Bible says, ask and you shall. So to have any doubts about when you ask for something and you know God promised it. Okay, see the Bible gives us lists of promises that God says he will back with his own life. So if he says, I already made healing available to you. It isn't him deciding whether he wants you healed or not. Healing is there. You have to, by faith, reach up and grab it. Pull it into your bosom. Now listen to me carefully and put the word before your eyes so you don't see anything else but your healing. And make sure you don't open your mouth and tell people, I'm having a lot of fear and I'm frustrated. I wonder what's going on. Do not say those things. Because think about it. When you ask God for something as important as healing, because you need healing, we all do. And, and we want to believe that we receive. And we know our Father never says no, because all the promises of God are yes, and in him, amen. So it isn't a question of God not doing it. It's a question of you to continue to receive it. Can you say amen? If your garden is thirsty, keep it watered. Listen, our body is thirsty for healing, but we have to keep the water of the word before our eyes so that the picture of us whole and being healed is greater than the picture of us not being. And you can do that. How many here are saved? How do you know you're saved? If I come to you and say, are you sure you're saved? You know that you know that you know that you know you're saved. How did you get that way? By referring to it, talking about it, looking at it, referring to it. Same with healing. Don't let anybody be talking to you. Oh, what are you going to do? You say, Lord, I gave you my life. Oh, Lord, I gave you my body. You heal it. Lord, I'm putting the word in front of my eyes. God said to Joshua. Now, Joshua, you're going to take over. Moses is dead. This is what God said. Now, Joshua, you've got to keep the law in front of you. You've got to keep the wisdom of God in front of you so that I can guide your steps along the way. Otherwise, the enemy is going to fill your mind with lies and all kinds of things to distract us so that we don't believe God for anything. We're running by our feelings rather instead. Everyone says, not me. So you need, when you pray, it, you believe, you ask, you receive, and then you thank God until everything shows up. You don't stop thanking God. Don't do this. Lord, I thanked you when I first got saved. If I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. Oh, 
<laughs> just joking with you. You know, my wife says to me, honey, I told you I, I loved you when we got married. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. But see, that's how we are. We don't talk to God every day. We, we need to interact with God, especially for believing something, for, for our body to be whole. Can you say amen? amen? So don't be irresponsible. Okay, don't be irresponsible. This is life and death here. Now, all of you are saved. So the way I look at it, I believe God for not losing my leg. I believed it for over a year. Now, listen, I'm talking to you. I never stopped believing, yet I, I have no leg, and God replaced it. Was I in error? No. My job is not to reason why, how, this. Be careful of that, because you know who has access to our, our mind, too. Now, he can't read your mind, but he suggests to your mind. He suggests to other people's minds. You know, you're praying and asking God and believing God for something where other people are involved then you've got to pray over their minds too so Satan doesn't influence them in a negative way. Say me, say oh me, <laughs> say amen and or me, or, or, or me. My, my eye tooth is getting in the way with my tongue and so it's hard to see what I'm saying. All right, so here we go. In, and here, here, John 16, Jesus is talking here. We're going to be dealing with the power of revelations of the word of God. He says, I still have many things to say to you. Now he's talking to his disciples, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, you won't get them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into what? How much truth? Now, here's the key. Not evil truth, not truth about your neighbor, what he's doing wrong. All truth concerning God's plan for man and you personally. The Holy Spirit is to take you by the hand and walk you into all the truths that God had lined up before the foundation of this world. He will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority. Hi, I am the Holy Spirit. I am the Holy Spirit. No, he never calls attention to himself, always points to Christ. But whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to, come on, folks. He will tell you things to, you want to know about tomorrow? Who do you go to meet to hear about it? Don't meet with them. You're going to have to guess about tomorrow. Now, that's still okay because you can believe for tomorrow. Can you say amen? Remember, Satan doesn't know your tomorrow. He's hoping to plague your mind so tomorrow you're going to worry too. No, God's with me today and tomorrow he'll be with me too. Can you say amen? For in him I live, in him I move, in him I have my existence. So it goes on further to say whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. See, the Holy Spirit's job in the earth is to point you to Christ, to center you on Christ. Every time you keep wandering away, he keeps moving you back to Christ. For he will not, he will take of what is mine and declare it unto you. The word declare is interesting because it means that he will stand there and tell you until you're blue in the face. <laughs> you don't get it now, 10 minutes, he'll tell you again. You don't get it now, Tomorrow morning, you'll wake up, he'll tell you again. God moves us incredibly through our steps of growth. If we miss a step, God will return you to that step, and you'll repeat it. Have a problem with your neighbors and unforgiveness? You'll keep going around that mountain till you fix it. You'll be going around that mountain till God's fix it. You'll be going around that mountain, spewing in fountain. You'll be going around the mountain till God fixes it. So you get with God and let him fix everything. Fix, 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 fix me, fix me, fix me, fix me. Help me to dog. Just fix me. And God says, hey, Carrie, have you come today? What do you suppose you came for? To be fixed. <laughs> Are you? Say he bad. Okay. So you got it. God wants us to tune up, tune in. And be led by the Spirit into every bit of truth. Now, here's why he does that. He has to bypass Satan. Satan likes to listen in to every conversation. 
He likes to, to bypass and to hinder our growth. So God brought the Holy Spirit, and if we seek him, he has a supernatural hotline that he injects truth into you, bypassing your mind and the flack of the enemy. Oh, we have another part of the scripture. Oh, thanks. Amen. So all things that the Father has are? Okay, say this with me. The Father has things, Jesus has things, and in me I'd have them too, right? So therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it unto you. A little while and you will see me, you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me and again, because I go to the Father. What's he saying? I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's job is to teach you how to walk with Jesus is to coach you how what not to say and what to say. It's to train you how to move in the realm of supernatural power. Amen. Because you are a God child now. You're a child of light. You're the light. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. So why, if we're the, all these good things, why are we letting the devil beat the tar out of us? Because we're ignorant or we're not applying the word properly. This is why God, God, excuse me, God bypasses the human mind and go right to the spirit. It's called revelation knowledge. Every, everyone say this to me. God wants to reveal to me his plan by his spirit and not just head knowledge. Now you read the Bible. I read the Bible, right? But have you ever been reading the Bible and suddenly something leaped off the page? That's revelation knowledge. You get, you're just reading the Bible and you're studying, you're reading tracts and you're enjoying. Suddenly something just comes right up and really speaks to you. That's revelation knowledge. That's the bypass that Satan can't pick up on. For example, let me give you just, just a simple example. I've read for years where it says that the disciples, Jesus said, go get in the boat, go over to the other side. And then we know what happened. The storm comes, you know, and the winds blow. And they see Jesus walking towards them because they're going to feel like they're going to perish. Jesus says, you're going to the other side, didn't he? But they think they're going to perish. Amen. And so they see Jesus. Peter says, oh my gosh, it's a ghost. Now, what God showed me, revelation knowledge, is that Old Testament. They really didn't know God, did they? And even though they had been with Jesus, they didn't really fully understand everything he was trying to tell them, did they? So in the Old Testament, Jesus is not in our boat. But he still commands us to do things. But we're not in the Old Testament. Can you say amen? So God showed me this. He says, in the Old Testament, I'm out of the boat. I wasn't in the boat. They still suffered things. He says, in the New Testament, I'm in the boat. He's in your heart. But still the enemy brought a storm. Oh, what? Is that a failure of God in your boat that the storm came? No. That's Satan's job is to harass you. Put him in his place. You have Jesus where? In your heart. Stand up and tell the weather, shut up. Tell the devil to be quiet and put him in his place. And so... Jesus didn't have to walk in the water to come to him. He was in the boat. And what was Jesus doing? He was asleep, resting in his father's plan. He says, look, guys, we're going to the other side. So here comes the winds and everything like that. Unusual storm. These were fishermen, folks. They've seen many a storm. These storms were demonic. And when all the storm was going and everything, they still got up and they said, we perish. Yet Jesus was in the boat. Because they were watching and seeing and commenting on what was around them instead of who was with them. Get it. Who's with you? Well, then stop talking about what the devil's doing. The devil's harassing my boyfriend. The devil's doing that. And the devil's doing that. How do you know? You watching them? Come on, I'm just teasing you a little bit to get you to, oh, hey, that's right. So we see that this time, Jesus is in the boat. New Testament. How did, I, how did I have that? It was revealed to me that a lot of people are trying to believe in the New Testament in Old Testament principles. 
And when they do that, nothing works. Because that's an old covenant that had been fulfilled, whose promises are still good, but the laws and the principles of it have been done away with. So I don't care how many times you wave a flag, that's not going to press God. He'll go tell you, put it down and let me see your heart. <laughs> and so let me just stand. So Jesus was in their boat, and yet they still panicked. What did Jesus do? He got up and rebuked the wind and the waves. Now, here's the thing God just gave me. This is a revelation. You have God in you, right? He's in your boat, right? Let him stand up and rebuke the devil for you. Why are you doing it so loudly? Why are you telling the devil off so much? Let Jesus stand up in you. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. I never thought of that, Pastor. Of course, it comes by revelation knowledge. If you would have thought about it, Satan would have talked you out of it. But the revelation knowledge that comes through the word by the power of God's spirit comes right directly into your heart. And there's no stopping the results and the power that it brings. When God said to Peter, Peter, I know you've been fishing all day, but throw your net over on the right side this time. At your word... I've been, I'm tired, Lord, but nevertheless, he said, now listen, at your word, I will do it. You see, the Bible says God lives big in us, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When Satan threatens you, let God arise and your enemies be scattered. Let God arise. But we don't. We mount up and we're ready to deal with it. And, and Satan just laughs. Yeah, I slapped you around before. <laughs> I'll slap you around this time. Then you say, Jesus, and man, he flees. We fight with Jesus. We don't fight in our own strength for Jesus. We fight releasing Jesus. The same God that swiped and wiped out the devil lives in your heart. Release Jesus. Release Jesus. Release Jesus. Dwell on God, can you say amen? Now we're ready to start the lesson. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Go with me to Mark chapter 4, please. How many here born again? What does that mean? God dwells in you, right? You're on your way to heaven. No one can take Jesus out of your heart. And you're too smart to give him up, aren't you? So let me read my paragraph to you. God sent the Holy Spirit, and the Father set it all up. He sent Jesus to fulfill all righteousness and to finish the work of redemption. Then Jesus passed through the heavens, the first heaven, the second heaven, into the abode of God, sat down at the right hand of the Father in full authority. He said, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Now the Father has full access because of what Jesus did to send the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, to guide us, to teach us, to reveal things to us beyond Satan's hindrances. The problem is we are being religious, not, not you guys, as a church, rather than getting close to God and being taught by Almighty, the master teacher. It says when the Spirit will come, he's called a comforter, a coach, an advocate, an intercessor, a lawyer. a supporter, and a teacher. That's what the Holy Spirit's job is, to point you to Christ, and you and Christ walk in such a way so he shows you things to come. Rather than the devil showing you what tomorrow might bring, sit down with God and let God open the eyes of your understanding that he may show you it's going to be a good day tomorrow, sister. I'm with you. Not only that, but if you open up, I'll show you some great things during the day. Amen. That's your God. He knows you have to be on this planet for a time. He can't just sweep us up. So if you're going to be on this planet for a time, he needs you to be so close to him so he can show you all the good things that Satan's hidden from us. The word occult means hidden under darkness. See, so Satan, the God of this liturgy of this world, 
has hidden the things that you need to know and revealing all kinds of lies. Well, what God did by the Holy Spirit is he came in and now he's opening the eyes of our understanding and we're beginning to see the plan that Satan wants to hide from us. We have a personal relationship with God. We are not religious. Satan's plan is to give you religion, to mingle the Old Testament with the New so you're powerless. So you mix the covenants up. And, and so you say things like this. Well, you never know what God's going to do. He could be leading you through the mud and the crud. And he's proven to you how unfaithful you are. Have you heard things like that before? That is not New Testament. That is not the gospel. That is absolutely a deception. Who lives in you? Now, the problem with the church is they're not studying about the God insideness. They're studying about trying to be worthy to God or trying to get God to do things. Deception. We need to be trained about who lives in us, how to walk with him, how to hear his voice, how to move in step with him, how to be in harmony with heaven, and how that we pray things get done. That our faith not stand in the wisdom of men. That our faith not stand in all the religions of men. But our faith stands in the power of God and his gospel. Can you say amen? Don't tell me you have power. I want to see you knock a few people down. Just by pointing at them. I used to do that for fun. Remember that? I mean, whole rules of people go. Finally God says stop that. Everybody's going to make that important. And instead of their relationship with God, I mean, I used to go, <clears throat> and whole rows of people fall right over. Still can do it. But what's that going to prove? Let's just blow a few devils out instead. Can you say amen? Ta 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 ta. Ta 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 ta. Amen. <laughs> All right. Have you got Mark? All right. Look at verse 10. But when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. Remember he had cursed the fig tree? Remember he told about some things? Now they asked him and he says, and he said to them, do you, to you, it has been given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Who has it been given to? Not Satan, right? So everyone say mystery. It's what we call a transliteration. That means that they didn't have a real word for it in the Greek. So they just took it and brought it right over like that, and they put a, a, an English definition on it. How many of you ever belonged to a club or had a club when you were younger? Was there an initiation to it? Remember, for some reason, we always stuck in initiation. You know, you got to eat 12 apples, you know, like, like Scott. You got to eat 20 eggs. No. Anyway, just kidding. I'd love to tease Scott. He's going to kill me. Anyway, you think about it. The word mysterion means hidden teaching only for a certain group. That's all it means. A hidden teaching from certain eyes, but revealed only to the membership of that certain club or group. Say amen. Did you know you belong to a certain cl club and group? Did you know that? You didn't know that. You're the born again club. You have been initiated. You have Jesus in your heart. So the mysteries have been given unto you to know. But not to the swine and not to the people who have no respect for God. But the key is for you and I, we have to go after it. Seek and we shall. There you go. Now watch. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to those that are outside, not saved. People outside are the ones that are not initiated, born again. So the natural man does not be able to receive the things that are from God. 1 Corinthians 2. Natural man can't say. It seems like to be, they're just foolishness. How many know that God's not foolish? Nor is he do foolishness. All right. So and he says and those without. He speaks to them in parables. So that seeing they may, may see but not perceive. See the word see means also understand perceive. And hearing that they may hear but not understand, lest they should turn. Rip, the word turn there is repent. Everyone say repent. Look at your neighbor and say repent. Now, folks, we've, 
Repent's got a bad nomer. People think, oh, repent, you know, you've done something terrible. Repent simply means to turn and go the other way. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me, go the other way. And God says, I'm right there with you. It, we think repent means, oh, I'm sorry for my sin, and it does. But also, if you're being stubborn, it means, Lord, I'm being stubborn, sorry. That's a repentance. You always want to have a daily repentance before God so that we're not stubborn in the wrong things. Because stubbornness for God is okay, because you're not going to be moved. You're hanging on to God, say amen. But being stubbornness to think you think that the you, way you're doing things is right and everything, and everybody around you is telling you it's wrong, that's the wrong kind of stubbornness. Repent. Change and say, God, change me. Make me into something. You see? We don't want to always be the same, do you? I don't want to look in the mirror and always look the same. My wife's praying, please, God, no. Amen. So let's go on. We're going to cover four areas. Everyone get it? Okay. We're going to talk about the importance of being born again, knowing that God dwells in us. And that in a lot of the church today, they're always acting like God somewhere. Oh, the heavens have turned like brass. and seems like God is not listening to my prayers. Hey, because you're facing up in the north somewhere when you should be talking to your heart. Where does he live? So I always talk to God as he's some foreigner. Oh, Lord, if you be thy will. The reason why the leper came to Jesus and said, you can heal me. I heard that you can heal me. But I'm not sure if he really would. See, that's an Old Testament view. We take that and bring it in the New Testament. Lord, you, you prayed and believed that you received for healing. He says, Lord, I know you could heal me, but will you? That's the wrong thing. That's Old Testament boo-booism. You have God living in you. Don't even say that. Say, God, you're in me and you're the great physician. So have at it. Change me from the inside out. Heal. Deliver. If I got some weird stuff in my brain, push it out. Talk to God like that. He loves it. He says, finally, you realized it. <laughs> Everyone smile and say, God loves me. God lives in me. God wants the best for me. God wants to order my steps. God wants to fill my mind. And God wants me to give him glory. That's who you are. Now, people like me, I'm going to say things and challenge and do all that. But that's, mis misog that's massaging you to get you to open up to God. Words massage you. Preaching a good teaching massages you to open up to God. Hello? I mean, the Bible says in Romans 10, how are they going to hear without a preacher? That's me. <laughs> we need to share with one another. We need to tell everybody the truth. All right, these four things. Being born again, knowing the God inside mindedness, okay? Two, having the eyes of our understanding enlightened. You do not know everything. And there's a lot of things that you need to know. And the only way God wants to show you is he wants to bypass your head, blast it into your heart because God dwells in here, give it up to the eyes of your understanding and have you begin to see the revelation of who you really are. Say amen. Thirdly, we need to be conditioned in our heart to receive spirit teaching. It comes by the spirit. It doesn't come by just intellectualism. I can read with my mind the Bible and I can get a lot of stuff. But it isn't until God starts pulling it off, <coughs> pulling it off the page. Hello. <coughs> Sorry about that. I love to talk and, you know. And then finally, the fourth thing is how to be stable. Christians need to be stable, unmoved. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what the word says. It says we're receiving not a kingdom of God that can be shaken. Hebrews chapter, chapter 12. 
Read on down for the bottom of it. And it says, like it was in the Old Testament, they had a, a mountain that shook and people were afraid and everything was going on. But you have come to Mount Zion. You're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. God's building that kingdom in our heart. So if you feel still, there's some of you that's, uh, so, some of us on our outward man is still a little shaky and is still a little challenged. Get with God. Let him show you. And he'll move all that shakiness out of you. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. Well, folks, God's shaking the church too. Have you noticed? And only those founded on the rock are able to withstand. That's what he said always in the beginning. Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this. Not Peter, little pebble, but the revelation of God's word is what God builds your life on. How many here know you're saved? How many here know you're spirit filled? Let me ask you this question. How many here know you're healed? You should say it with the same velocity. Amen. Because Jesus did that 2,000 years ago, see? It's not based on whether you believe it or not. You should believe it and receive it. But even if you didn't believe it, it doesn't make the word of God of no effect. It's still true, whether you choose to be a part of it or not. Say amen. All right, first point, knowing God is in us. People who know God's in them do not struggle over the little things. Because the enemy is just trying us to get us and pull us away from our confidence in God. So let's see what it says. Colossians chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. What did we say the word mystery was? A hidden teaching for a certain group of people and the born again believers, right? Jesus hid that. He says, I don't cast my pearls or don't cast your pearls before the swine. That means don't share godly things with people who don't care. Hello. Don't, don't, mess, don't waste your time. I was the Bible answer man on Green River Community College for three years every summer. They couldn't get anybody else to do it. So I went down. Boy, what a challenge that was coming up with answers. But you'll find out there are several people who will ask a question, but they don't want to know the answer. They just want to argue. Never bother with them. Jesus turned and walked away. Two, there are people who want to know, but they haven't got time to hear the answer. You've got to weed them out. And then the people who live that you you want it, then you say, well, listen, hang around and I will share the answer. You know, and then there's impatient people. I want to know it now. I said, look, in 10 minutes, I can't answer that. But if you have about 15, I can. You see, there is quality answers for people who are really seeking God. But the people who are just mocking and making light of, don't waste your time with them. They're not ready yet. Their fruit's still bitter. Moving right along. Now listen. And he says, and it says, that which has been hidden from the ages and from, and from generations, but now has been revealed. See that? The revelation power of God's word. Revealed to his saints. What is it? To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery. Hidden teaching for a certain group among the Gentiles. Which is what? Christ in you. See, they never knew that God could come and dwell in them. The Old Testament saints had no idea that God wants to come and live in us. It was hidden until Christ died, rose again. He said, I'm going to send the comforter. The comforter is going to guide you into all truth. And he's going to reveal all these things of who you are supposed to be and how to get there and become that and to cut the enemy out of your life. Can you say amen? Which is in us. Christ in us, the hope of. So we have God in us. That means that the Father loves you because you have accepted his son. Automatically, you're on the winning team. Now, this is what people don't understand. I realize that the wages of sin is death. 
That's Romans 6, 23. But for a child of God, did Jesus die for our sin? Now listen to me carefully, otherwise you'll miss this. How much sin did Jesus die for? Okay, all sin, right? Past, present, and so here's what I'm trying to say now. I'm not belittling sin's power to destroy human beings. Satan's nature is sin, okay, S-I-N. But I'm telling you, you're no longer a sinner. You have accepted Jesus Christ, and now God Almighty's Son lives in your heart. Actually, all three. So you're no longer a sinner. So when you make a mistake, he doesn't look at you like you're a sinner. You stoop. He doesn't look at that. He looks at you as your little child of God just pooped his pants. That's how he looks at you. He says, oh my gosh, they listened to the enemy again and made a mess. So he reaches as best as he can that we have to give him invitation down to pull us up out of that. He took me out of the miry clay. He put a song in my heart today. Amen. Amen. A song of praise. Hallelujah. We're, we're children of God. So the idea behind that is to think that you're a child. Doesn't give you right to be sassy to God. Doesn't give you right to be a, a naughty child. But God is not going to deal with you as someone that is lost under Satan's control. Because you now have God in your heart. So that means you're disqualified. God is not going to prance you around in the world to, to have the world beat you up and the devil lie to you so he could teach you something. It does not make any biblical sense because God's already on the inside of you and he knows everything already. Doesn't God know everything already? Yes. Then are you going to teach, teach God in your heart anything? No. no. Pay attention and listen. Makes good sense, doesn't it? I'm not picking on you. But we don't. We blabber, blabber, and jabba, jabba, and we do all that and everything. We don't mean to. We're learning about ourselves. Be quiet and let God consult you and work with you. And then have fun, but make sure what you're talking is not reversing and insulting God who lives in you. I said, God lives in you. Don't insult them. It's called grieve the spirit. Don't do that. How could I do that, Pastor Kerry? By speaking bad about any other believer or child of God. Doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. That's God's property hands off. Just say, Lord, it doesn't seem like things are in order there, so take care of it. See, then, see, we don't know them. God does, and he's just and fair and everything. So when we pray that prayer for our enemies or for some other child of God, we know it's taken care of rightly, and we don't put that. And, Lord, I could, I could tell they really need your help. Don't add any of that stuff. Amen. So, so far, I've given you enough to make you a champion for the rest of your life. First of all, you don't do the fighting. You release God and let him do the fighting. First of all, stop talking to God like he's out there somewhere. He's dwelling in you. He's well aware about what you're going through more than you are. So turn your life daily over to him so he can take over in the areas you're not even aware you're out of order. See, there are areas of our life, they're the little foxes to get us out of order. And so we want him to take care of those, say amen, before those things chew up our vines. Knowing God that's in us. All right, a couple of points I want to give you. Number one, we as believers must focus on the fact that we are God indwelt. Say amen. Two, we must realize that God already knows everything, so don't try to tell him what you're going through. He stopped me one time, and I was just telling God, I have two kids, I have a full-time pastor, and I'm working for Boeing, and I got this, and I got that, and God says, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, God, I'm praying. He says, no, you're not. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> I really did. He says, no, you're not. I said, and, and remember, this is a kid learning. 
I said, then what am I doing? He says, you're complaining. I don't need you to fill me in on stuff I already know. I'm in you. I need you to fill the word in so I can act on your behalf on what is promised. And grasp that and say, God, I'm your child. I have a covenant with Almighty God. I'm a citizen of the earth and I'm a citizen of heaven. And bless God, you'll move heaven and earth on my behalf. Now I humble myself and I thank you for it. God will just do a happy dance to hear his children talk like that. You're in a fallen planet and he's went through hell and back to bypass everything Satan has done so he can get you the goods. Now that you got the goods, stop acting like a pauper. You're a stately child of God. Not full of pride, full of stately confidence. Can you say amen? You take control of every situation that's out of hand. Because you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Are you still with me? We could just stop right there and have church, couldn't we? Conscious, God is good. All right, so the third thing I want to encourage you in. So in our spirit man is where God dwells. Both God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit lives inside our spirit man. Not our head, not our body, but inside our spirit man. Our spirit man's inside of our body and our soul's inside of our body. Then finally, when we hear or read the word, listen, the God who lives in us. When we hear or read the word, if our heart is open, God who is the word inside of us will bear witness every time we run across the scripture or a truth that deals with us personally. You're reading along, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Oh Lord, that's so good. And then all of a sudden you get to the next scripture. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Bam! We've been, us preachers have been condemning the world and condemning the United States and we're condemning this, and we're condemning that. And God says, God didn't come in to condemn the world. He came in that the world might be saved. So stop condemning, start saving. Well, should we comment about some of the bad things? To God, not to me. Man, I know so much about what's going on. If I told you, some of you would die just out of the freakiness. People are playing with DNA and making non-humans. What are you going to do with that? Church. It says, it says right there in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Read it. It says that the last kingdom will be in the feet and iron won't mix with clay. And if you read it, it says that the devil's seed cannot mix with human seed. So in this day that we're living at, Satan is making hybrids. People that look like they're humans, but they're not. Blow your mind? He'd been doing that ever since the fall of Adam. Trouble is, religion has hid it from us. It's time we grow. Time we learn. Time we open our eyes and realize who we are time we realize that we are so equipped so blessed that even the devil has to move hell in, hell in the bottom of the earth to try to get us to stop when you decide that you want to see, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior there's not a devil in hell that can stop you, you notice that you just did it why do we think there are devils in hell keeping us from everything else they're not you just say get out of my way Get out of my way. Jesus lives in me. Try that sometime. Amen. You won't see a devil within miles. Then so, well, I know what I could do with Carrie. I can send him one of my relatives. One of his relatives, you know, and tell him off. Or, you know, so if he can't come to you directly, he's going to use somebody. So just recognize the stuff that's coming your way, where it comes from. Who's the source thereof? And don't let it sway your confidence. Say amen, somebody. All right, let's go to my next point. So say I'm in God and dwelt. Say I'm God and dwelt. Let me just show you a little bit about that. If you will just give me a little caution here. In 1 John 2, 24 through 27, if you want to go there, tells us what God does inside of us. Just a good insight for us just to look at a scripture and, and, and to see what God's actually doing inside of us. 
Everyone say anointing is God. God is the anointing. You really can't separate them. We, we try to by definition. God showed me that. How many's ever baked bread? How many's ever kneaded dough, baked bread? And you can get that little piece of uh, gooey dough, you know. And if your kids come running through the kitchen, you can toss one out of them, smack, you know, and just stick on them. Well, the anointing is just like that. It's like some gooey dough. Sticks on you and everything. But you can break off a part of it and you can flip it on people. You can. Oh, man, I had one, one guy, Brad. I, 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 Brad, I hope you're watching this. Brad and Cheryl. Brad had a, a, what they call a sandwich gut truck business, and he did really well. And he invited me to come along a couple times. I said, so, so Brad, well, let's have a perfect day. And Brad says, can we do that? I says, yeah, God lives, and let's have a perfect day. Let's claim it right now in Jesus' name. Sounds kind of goofy, doesn't it? And guess what we had? Three people came to the Lord on his route. And let me tell you about this. This is what I was trying to tell you. We were driving down... Um, I think it's Pioneer going to the Ording, going past the Ording place. You're going into Ording where there used to be the old Tula Bowl place and everything. And there's this truck riding our rear end, honking and riding our rear end. And he's going to come up and probably do something stupid, pull up alongside of us, you know. And so before I let, could let him, you know, who knows what he's going to scream at. You guys are driving too slow, whatever they're going to say. I turned by the unction of God. I just turned and I said, Jesus, like that. And the guy went, oh, oh, oh. they all backed off and they became instantly behaved people. I didn't know if they had a gun. I didn't know what they were going to do, but I ain't going to dwell on it. I'm just going to take authority over it. You learn to do the same thing. If it's something harassing you, and causing you harm, and you're wasting any more than a minute or two dwelling on it, take authority over it. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. So it says, therefore, and this is 1 John 2, 24, therefore let that abide in you. It's the truth. Let the truth of God abide in you that you have heard from the beginning. If you heard from the beginning abides in you the truth, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. How many here have eternal life? Wave your hands, say, I do, I do. Now look at verse, the next verse. These things I have written to you concerning those who would what? There's that deceive again. Remember, this is a fallen planet. Satan wants to deceive. But you hang out with God so much, you're not going to be deceived about your heavenly father. Say amen. Now look at this. And he says, deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides where? In you. You do not need anyone teach you. But the same anointing, God dwelling inside of you, teaches you concerning all things. And it is true and is not a lie, just as he's taught you to abide in him. Who lives in you? Does he know everything? Therefore, when you're searching scripture, you're hearing somebody like me preach, you're hearing, watching the videos and vids and clips and stuff like that, keep it Christ-centered. Anything you don't wonder about, don't wonder about it. Keep it Christ-centered. Only the things that God wants you to know will start leaping out at you because the Holy Spirit will feed you what you need to know with power. And it comes by revelation and not by just reading or dwelling on. It comes out of your spirit, not your head. Say amen. Nothing wrong with your head, although it's kind of lopsided. Amen. <laughs> Second point. Having the eyes of our understanding and light. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 15. If God dwells in your spirit, where's your head at? Here, where's your spirit? Inside of you. 15 inches from your head to heart. Heart to head. Your head is acceptable 
to any lies the enemy has. What's in the past lies, what's in the future lies, so we don't rely upon our own intellect or our own understanding. We rely on God in us. He comes up to our understanding and he gives us things that we need to know. Say you're studying Proverbs. Don't write it all off. I've heard it all before. Now you shut it all out with your intellectual stupidity and open your heart and be like a child and let God pull things out of the page and talk to you about it. Say amen. No one here is, knows it all, but the one who knows it all lives in you. And that's the anointing that you don't need anybody to teach you. You could walk in the woods. I have done it many times. Nobody around to teach me the word. I didn't have my little Bible with me. And God started talking to me about how his creation is. And he says, look at the birds. Look at the trees. They grow four ways. And he starts talking to me because I have the word in me. His name is Jesus. But I also have enough in my memory that he can start pulling out little things and start really having a conversation with me. My sheep shall hear my and a voice of a stranger. They will not follow. That's why you didn't like the, the fake news because if it was a voice of a stranger. That's why you don't like certain people when they're talking because you know they're lying. You know they're just full of it. That's a voice of a stranger. But we listen to the voice of our God. Amen. And where he leads us, we will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'm one of my old favorite songs. My mom used to play the piano. She'd do it the old bar honky tonk. We just bellow out some of those old songs. We had a great time. And now she's doing it for Jesus, probably on a grand piano. Amen. So are you still with me? So having our eyes of our understanding light. Look what it says. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. How many know we all need more wisdom? You want to find out what that wisdom is? Go into James chapter 3. Find out the wisdom that's from above. Okay? Then it says the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Notice that word? In the what? God wants you to know about Christ. But he wants it to be revealed to you. Not just told to you. I can describe Jesus to you wonderfully. But you just don't want to go on my description of Jesus. You want to listen to your heart and let God go, yeah, and that, yeah, and yeah. And he starts teaching you. So you don't think you have to remember anything. You don't. He already has it all memorized. The key is we're not conditioned to tap the source in us as much as we, should, we think we are. How do we get conditioned like that, Pastor? I love to tell you. Face-to-face -face time with God. He conditions you. Face-to-face -face time. Face-to-face -face time. Listen, this isn't something I'm trying to hammer. This is the number one teaching for the end times. You don't spend the time with God, you're going to be another casualty. This is the way it is. It's going to be that bad. Thank God we're not going to be here for the worst parts of it. But it's going to be bad. And so if we're a baby, just think if you're a baby Christian, you just got saved. And everything is so interesting. It's so wonderful. And then boom. We declare war. Somebody drops a bomb. Suddenly the whole scenario's changed. Where's that Christian going to go? To be with God. To meet with God. To find out what's going on. And so if you haven't really started that, please do. God will fill you. You won't be moved about anything. Now, I told you about my intercessor, Beulah. I, I've seen, remember, I used to hobnob with Casey Treat and Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Seville, Norval Hayes, preached with Oral Roberts. That's not a brag. But that's what I was raised. I was raised in those kind of people. I didn't hear any of them talking all this unbelief I'm hearing nowadays. They talked faith and they believed God for stuff. Were they right all the time? No. No. And I couldn't believe it 
Once my pastor left, he says, go find a good church. Couldn't find any. I went to four or five of them. Two of them I was kicked out of. I knew more than the pastor did. And I, what was, saved three years? Wrong. There's a lot of spiritual jealousy in the church. Now, I'm not running down other churches. We need to learn to minister together. We need to be together. Let our hair down and stop comparing and start loving God and build an army. I can hear the dry bones rattle in. Amen. Are you with me? So I want you to just listen to this part while I read this scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 through 6. Okay, on my second point. It says, but even if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those that are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded, who does not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ should, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. Come by revelation. For it is the God who, it is our Father who commanded light to shine out of darkness, which has shone in our hearts, not our heads. Revelation comes to our heart, not our head, so that the eyes of our understanding then gets it. It comes from here to here. It doesn't come from here to here. You don't get it here first and it drops down. You get it because God's inside of you and he pushes it up to your eyes of your understanding. And he'll only do it if you want to know. If you could care less to know, you'll never know. You'll still be saved. You'll still love you. But you'll be an ignorant Christian. We have too many of those. Ask God why. Ask God to show you the way he has things arranged so that you can work with him. Can you say amen? Quite like driving a car. When I first knew that somebody could drive a car, I asked my dad, Dad, can I drive? He says, you're only free. <laughs> you got to get a little older. But he used to sit me on his lap when we used to drive around when we pulled in the snow and stuff. That's why I used to always say, I learned to drive when I was in Montana. I left Montana when I was four and a half. <laughs> so going on past all that, driving. You know driving is cool. It's better than walking. But you're young. You don't know how to drive. The grace of driving doesn't come until you learn about driving. You take the driving test. You learn. Somebody works with you, teaches you how to back up and all that. That's what I'm here for to teach you about who you are, to help you understand maybe a different way to hear it so something clicks mm -hmm. that you got insight to the word that no one could take from you because revelation knowledge is the teaching that God gives you into your heart that Satan cannot steal from your understanding because God, God can't be taken out of your heart. Did you know that? If you got him in there, nobody could snatch him out of your heart. Not, not only that, but it says no one could snatch you out of his heart. See, now I'm not advocating once saved, always saved, because that's a bunch of bananas. But I lean to the fact that God's ability to keep me and save me, far more powerful than Satan to destroy me. But I don't mess with the rest. You see? I don't mess with the enemy. I just put him in his place. Don't mess with him. Just put him in his place. Your, your child is being rebellious. Sit that child down and put him in their place. Hello. Otherwise, God is going to talk to you about how your child is and say, why didn't you do a better job? So don't get under guilt. Just say, God, help me. Help me to do a better job. What can I do now to fix the situation? Your child is still sitting at home when God wants him in church. And you say, well, I can't make him do things. No, but he's under your roof and you are spoiling him and ruining him. Because the Bible says you teach him the way he's to do it. That means march him in the bathroom, put a toothbrush in his mouth and go... Whoosh, 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 whoosh. You don't say, oh, pick up the little brushy, put the little brushy in your mouth, and then if you feel good, brush your teeth. That's how we treat our kids. 
The Bible says, train them up in the way they should go. And so when they get older, they won't depart because they're scared to, uh, to death to leave God. You made sure of that. Now, it's not too late for some of you. It's just a fact. Don't let somebody's human will who has no clue, like a teenager or a young adult, tell you how they want to do things. If they're under your roof, you tell them. And you say, if you mess up, bye-bye. Especially if they're older than 18. You know what my dad did to me when I turned 18? For my birthday, he brought in two luggage things. <laughs> set them right in the living room. They were empty. He says, son, I want you to think about other things now. I says, dad... He wants me to be mature enough to go out into the world, not live at home like Isaac did. He didn't live, Isaac never left home till he was 43. That's why he was called laughter. <laughs> he wouldn't get out of the house. Abraham had to go get his servant to find him a wife to get him out of the house. Check it out. We got it. Honey, Sarah, we got to get Isaac out of our house. I've done preach myself happy. Thank God I never had that problem. All right, move on. <laughs> My next point, conditioning of the heart. Folks, the Bible tells us about the parable of the sower. It says there are those on the wayside. Those are on thorny ground. Those are on stony ground. And then there's the good ground. It's the condition of our heart. How do we hear the word? How do we pay attention to God? It's the condition of our heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I need a lot of mar marination. How many know what marinating meat is? When I go to meet with God, I ask him to marinate me. Marinate my meat. <laughs> Kill my flesh. If I'm born again, then I am crucified with Christ. I'm buried with him in baptism. So it's no longer I that lives. I meet with God and throw my flesh down and he pulverizes it. And then as I'm ready to meet and I get tanked up, filled up, then he takes it like a jacket, he puts it back on me and he says, you won't have any more problems with that throughout the rest of the day if you walk in love. So your flesh becomes your servant and now that's own mealy mouth thing. Can you say amen? Look at your neighbor and say, thank God I can't see your flesh. All right. So we need conditioning. Well, Jesus, what did Jesus say? Let's go with the Matthew chapter 11. Very familiar scriptures. Verse 25 through 30 says, And at that time Jesus answered and said, listen, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things. Remember, we're talking about revelation. God hides his revelations to you from the devil. It's not till we open our mouth and tip the devil off. When God speaks to you, Satan can't hear it. When God gives you revelation knowledge, he can't see it. But it's just really alive to you. But it's what you do with once you received how you talk about it. Are you with me? Hidden these things from the wise and prudent, but have revealed them to babes. That's us. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me, Jesus said, by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And no one to whom the Son wills to show him. Come, then he says something. Come to me. Come to who? How often should we come to him? Every day. Every day. And sometimes throughout the day. The word come there is the Greek word keep on coming. Come and keep on coming. Come, keep visiting with me. Keep being with me. Come, keep on coming. I'm going to show you how I operate. I'm going to teach you my ways. Come, hook up to me. Built yourself in. You and I are going for a ride. So listen to what it says. 
Remember, religion had a piece of this. It says, and then he says, and then it says, and all things have been delivered to me. And he says, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden. The reason why you labor and get heavy is we're doing it in our natural strength. Try mixing God in with that. And I will give you what? Do it God's way. You'll be rested even when you're busy. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. We are to take his yoke. We are to belt in with God. Say amen. He doesn't belt in with us. We belt in with him. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Not learn about me. Learn from me. For I am gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I, mean, I can remember the old Pentecostals 20, 25 years ago. They say, and the Lord's given me a burden. Read Jeremiah 15. It'll tell you, he that says the Lord's given me a burden isn't, anything, isn't worth the manure under a tree. <laughs> God doesn't give you burdens. He gives you assignments. He gives you blessings and then says, I'll be right there helping you fulfill them. God lay out a race for every one of us to run. That race is our life. But we have to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, through every day that we walk. Can you say amen? Then you'll have successful days. Nobody's going to harass Carrie when I'm walking in Jesus. Folks, I'm going to tell you this. I have a lot of friends that I know, but their walks are pretty shaky. They're outside somewhere. And they say, oh, I, I can't wait to come see you again. Something like that. They won't be able to come see me at all until they get their lives together. Because God doesn't want me hanging out with people whose lives are all ripped apart. Who want to make me a show or, or make conversation out of me. God won't allow it. And he won't allow that with you either. So when, when your friends show up out of the blue, ask if that's the right kind of friend for you. Because <laughs> things can come up that God didn't send. God wants you to be discerning on who's your friend. Hey, I'm a poet today. Let's go on. All right. So he goes on further. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is. Right. God never teaches you or abuses you or tells you you're worthless or says you better get with the program because you're way behind. He never does any of that. He's right there working with us. And besides, he lives in us. All right, so conditioning of the heart, say amen. amen. To get our heart conditioned, to receive the word of God, it's our responsibility through prayer, worship, and time with God. Second is, two things we have that we must deal with and ask God to help us. That is our flesh and our unrenewed mind. Now, let me see, just, just kind of see. How many's ever been going along, minding your own business, and you just had this weird, ugly thought pop up? Don't raise your hands. We all have. Who do you think went, bing, threw that at you? And why? Because see, you're headed in too good of a direction. You're just too happy. You're just too happy. So he goes, bing, carries a jerk. Just look. And then, boop, he switches you from the good journey to, yeah, maybe he is. <laughs> Bless your heart. I love you. I'm almost done with you. Thank God this guy talks forever. First Peter chapter 5 tells us how to be humble. Can you say amen? If we're going to receive from God, we have to be humble. Amen. Confident and humble. Not prideful. Listen, if you have to say me, I, in your conversation more than three times, there's too much of you in the conversation. I did, I went, I'm gone, I'm working hard, I'm, 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 I'm. Check yourself. I asked God, this is one of the ones God showed me, Revelation. He says, son, how many times do you mention yourself and when you pray to me? I said, well, knowing you, God, probably too much. Everything went silent. 
and I got it. It suddenly rose up that I am not that important, only to God. So if I think I'm important, then God becomes second place. And I don't mean to put him second. So rather to, to avoid that, I, I meet with God and have him humble me in the sight of the Lord. I say, God, the thing I want to be more than anything is a humble man that just loves you. Boy, that's a, that's a big project for God. <laughs> All right. It says, likewise, you younger. This is First Peter chapter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, you younger people, subject yourself to the elders, the older people. Yes, all of you, be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the what? The proud and gives grace to the? So therefore, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. The best way up for us is down in humility. You see, when we make demands and we, we start doing things because we have real need, when we start making demands, who's in front of God? Say, so Lord, you promised, and Lord, I'm holding you to your word. That's all you need to say. And you can whisper that. No disrespect, all full God, and he goes right at it. Can you say amen? You see, I had a beautiful father. He was a good father. And oftentimes I would come to him, and he would say to me, what is it? What do you need? Because he knew me. Well, your father knows you, and he knows every time you come to him, you have need. Don't stop asking. Amen. In fact, that's why the saviors come, because you have great need, and he doesn't want you to go to hell. So ask all the time. So I come to my dad, and I says, uh, no, dad, today I just want to tell you I love you. And he looks at me, his mouth drops. He says, are you sick? Our God will never do that to us. Never, never. But, but you think about it. If, if you ever tried this, if not, maybe you do. You go and say, Father, I come and I'm not going to even ask for anything for a while. I'm just going to come and hallow your name. Just tell you I love you. If I could, I'd hug your neck. God, you bring tears to my eyes and you soften my heart. And I just start telling him how much he means to me. And so when you do that, all heaven is open. The angels, now listen, the angels are watching. They're listening to you too. It says that the church teaches the angels the manifold wisdom of God by our relationship to them. Here we get to talk to God as if he's our friend. They talk to God as if he's a captain and absolutely in charge, which he is. To which of the angels, as he said, every time, you are my son, sit at my right hand. He's never. And Lucifer, that's a message to Lucifer. You'll never make it, dude. You're done. You're ripped. You're done. These are my children. And all I want is their attention. You start loving on God and heavens open wide. Can you fence the, the anointing coming right on in here? That's, that's a tickle his fancy with your love. Just don't, don't be a con. Did you know there's a lot of people that are conning Jesus when they come to him? Hey, God, if you do this, I'll do that. Get me out of this one. I'll never do that again. Yeah. <laughs> the God who knows the beginning from the end. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Remember, you're his child. He gets great sense of humor from you. All right, last point. Yes. A stable walk is built and the result of hearing and doing the word as it's revealed to us. Hearing what Jesus said and doing what he's revealed to us. This brings stability. Matthew 16, please. This is the story. I'm just going to talk about this. And then I'm not, I want you to go to Luke 646. You go to Luke 646, it's not in there. And I'll go to Matthew 16. Let me say, remember Jesus, they just came from Caesarea and Philippi. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, 
What's everybody saying about me? What are the people in the crowd saying? And of course, a disciple says, well, some say you're Jeremiah the prophet. Some say you're Elijah the prophet. Okay, you're a forerunner. You're not the Messiah, you're a forerunner. But he, then he says, and he looks at him and he says, but who do you say that I am? I've been with you three and a half years. What are you making me now? How am I now? Peter opens his mouth and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven, revealed this to you. The revealed word of God is the rock that God builds his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Not Peter. He's not the first pope. He says, upon this rock, the revelation of God revealing his word to you, that's what you're to stand on. And it says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against that kind of truth. So better get your teaching from the spirit and study your word. Because an ignorant Christian is just good fodder for the devil. And... He says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. Now, over in Luke 6, 46, I'm just going to quote it, unless they can get it up there for me. I don't have it in my notes. It says, says this. Now, how many children of God do we have today? Look at all of you. You're wonderful. It says, don't call me your Lord if you're not going to do what I tell you. First scripture, Luke 6, 46 says, don't call me Lord and Lord if you're not going to do what I tell you. Then he says, he that heareth my sayings and does them is, I'll show you to whom he's like. He's like unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Floods came and the winds blow and it beat upon the house. It could not shake it or make it fall because it was founded on Christ. Is your life founded on Christ or is there still a lot of you that gets pinged and bumped. If that is, and you're getting whacked on a little bit, go and say, God, crucify that last part of me that I want to hold on to. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You got little things you're holding on to. But see, you don't have to worry about those little things unless God goes, Carrie, I want you to deal with that now. Gosh, you guys are great. So he says, don't call me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do what I say. But he that, that does what I say, hears my sayings and does them, you're wise. Because you built your house upon God who cannot be moved. And when the floods come and the winds beat on that house, it could not shake it. For it was founded on a rock. It's the hearing of the revelation of God's word. And it's the doing of the revelation of God's word. Now here's the neat thing. This sermon, do you think it came from Carrie or do you think it came from the throne? Because you can feel the anointing in it, can't you? That's God in there. That's what you want to look for when you're under listening to sermons, and listening to things. You want to look for the God part in there ministering to you personally. So everyone say, it's not by might, not by, might. Not by power, not by but power. by the spirit that I am taught. God gives me revelation knowledge and insight to his plan and his purpose for my life. I have to seek him for it and the Holy Spirit will show me things to come. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, give the Lord a big hand clap, will you?